G'day, I'm Paul. We're doing something interesting today. Uh, we did a road trip a little while back with a diesel and an EV, and we wanted to see if you drove through a regional Australia, what was cheaper and what is charging infrastructure like? Well, today we're gonna do a different version of that. We took your feedback on board last time about the cars being different, the speeds being different. Well, today we've got the same cars, and we're gonna replicate that test, but on a main route between Melbourne and Sydney. Bring my mate in here at the moment. Joe Achilles, he's an absolute legend of a bloke and loves his BMWs. Joe runs a YouTube channel, you can Google him. Joe Achilles, how are you mate? Very good, thanks, very good. Mate, I'm excited because we've got the new 7 Series. Um, I know people are thinking, well, that's not exactly a realistic option for most Australians to buy, but what we wanted to do was take a vehicle with a big battery, it's got over 100 kilowatt hours, and we wanna see in the future when cars are fitted with bigger batteries, exactly what it's gonna be like for a road trip like a Melbourne to Sydney, which a typical Australian family would have done 10, 15 years ago. So that's about 900 kilometres, right? Yep. Wouldn't most people just fly? Look, uh, they would, but uh, when I was a kid, we used to drive because <laughs> we were poor and flying uh, was very expensive. Now flying is much cheaper, but it's kind of the yardstick of road trips. And I know 900 k's probably in Europe. I don't know, do you do 900 k's from your home in the UK? Probably not so much in the UK, but I do go down to the Alps quite a lot, which is a similar sort of <laughs> distance. So yeah, have you heard of the Alps? I have, yeah. mate. We've got all of Europe on our doorstep. Yeah. We literally go through a tunnel and there you go, just like that. Yeah, Boom. we go through a tunnel and we end up in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> I've experienced a lot of that over here. I bet. Um, but yeah, I, I reckon it's going to be interesting just to see exactly how these cars are going to go and, and how expensive it is, because people are saying EVs are you know, coming. Are they going to be more affordable than an efficient car like that? So. Um, yeah, let's hit the road, see how we go. Cool. Good luck, mate. Thanks, mate. <laughs> I'm at 100%. Joe is brimmed as well. I said in the intro that we wanted to have two cars that were the same, with the only difference being that one is internal combustion and then one isn't. Uh, so obviously that is the, the main difference between these two. But in addition to that difference, there is a massive weight difference. So this vehicle, the i7 M70, weighs uh, just under 2.7 tonnes. It is absolutely enormous. Uh, it's around 600 kilos heavier than the 740i that Joe's in. We actually did consider sticking 600 kilos worth of payload in Joe's 7 Series to have them uh, equal weight. The problem is the payload is only 695 kilos, so it meant that if we put 600 kilos worth of uh, sandbags or something in, um, Joe, who uh, promises me he is um, at or around 95 kilos, would have us breaching GVM. So it tells you that uh, they've actually had to increase the suspension and, and the handling capacity of the i7 because it is a significantly heavier vehicle, which I find really fascinating. So the first part of our trip here is going to be, I guess, leaving Melbourne. The Ampol that we were at was in a suburb called Hawthorne, which is kind of a sort of inner city suburb. And then to get onto the freeway to get out of here, we have to travel basically through the city and onto the freeway to, to get to where we need to go. So it is a little bit of a, a maze to get out of here, but it'll give us a good indication of what economy is like in and around the city here. We've reset all of the trip computers, uh, and then obviously once we get to our destination, we'll fill the cars up to see exactly how much everything has cost us. Uh, and I've got to say, it is so quiet in here. <laughs> the amount of like, uh, sort of glazing they have on this glass and insulation they have, it is just absolutely dead silent. So Joe, uh, what we've got coming up here is what I think is one of the most dangerous pieces of, uh, I guess, speed enforcement uh, in Australia and, and the world in general. It's called an average speed camera zone. And Great idea in theory. The problem is that not everyone has calibrated uh, speedometers and the end result of that is you can have variants of between 0 and 10 kilometres an hour that is built into the Australian design rules that these cars come in on. The secondary part of that is that because people are so paranoid about getting a fine, they will sit in the blind spot of a truck doing what they think is 100 k's an hour because they don't want to exceed the speed limit. And you end up with this dangerous scenario where it can be raining and then people are sitting in that exact spot because they're too scared to speed up. So uh, I just think on this stretch of road in particular where you do have a lot of um, heavy vehicles, it is such a dangerous thing to have. Um, what's your experience with these uh, back home? Yeah, we have a similar thing back home. Um 
the majority of people don't seem to understand average speed cameras either. They speed up to them and then slow down when they get to the camera and then speed off again. So either the UK ones don't work or these people just get a lot of fines. Um, but yeah, like so many speed deterrent things, cameras, etc., they seem to cause in the long term a bit more problems than in the short term. Um, and dangerous driving that surrounds them. I want to quickly talk about efficiency. And it's an interesting time to be doing this road trip because uh, like we found with our last road trip, when you are driving an EV and it is cold, it is going to, to just chew through your battery a little quicker than it would if it was at the optimal temperature. You might be asking yourself, what is the optimal temperature for an EV? So uh, based on a number of studies that I've come across, the optimal temperature is around 21, 22 degrees Celsius. So that means that at that temperature, the vehicle isn't having to use a huge amount of energy to heat the cabin. The vehicle isn't having to use a huge amount of energy to heat or cool the battery. And that is your optimum range. And you will actually get more than your stated battery range driving at that temperature. Obviously you can't control the temperature, so that's that's something to think about. But today where we're going to expect to see sort of 28, 30 degrees on our road, uh, it's now 23 degrees outside, that's probably going to push it outside of its comfortable operating range because we're going to be calling on the air conditioner to, to cool the cabin. We'll see how that sort of fares as we go. And I'm hoping to see a reduction here in our average uh, energy economy. What about the internal combustion car? So I couldn't find anything conclusive uh, with regards to whether you should be driving an internal combustion car when it's cold or when it's hot for its uh, optimum efficiency. There are a lot of factors involved in that. So uh, I'll be keen to see what Joe's economy is like, but typically with an internal combustion car, it is significantly better on the freeway once it is moving and you don't have that fluctuation in engine revolutions. So these new sevens have got electronic doors that open and close for you. But apparently they sense if there's something surrounding or close by. So let's just test this out with another seven series. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, it works. Thank God for that. Um, so I was just doing my wee stop and I got a message from Jade back at the office. Um, so this morning, the Optus network, which is a cellular network here in Australia, went completely down. And she wrote, you had no issues with amp charge this morning, right? Question mark. EV networks is down because of Optus. Just checking RE amp charge. Um, now the charger we're going to in Takara is an EV networks charger. So uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I've still got 900 kilometers of range left in mine, so mate, yeah. there's plenty of room in the back seat and <laughs> well, you, can, you can jump in with me if you want. Well, I've got a big screen in there, I might just watch a movie or something, but... Um... You won't be able to do that if it runs out of power entirely. <laughs> anyway, aside from that, the driver's going great at the moment. Four hours into our journey, just under an hour to go until we get to our lunch stop. Thankfully, the car doesn't need any lunch because it has 793 kilometers of range still remaining. 139 kilometers of range left and 123 kilometers of driving left to go. We've averaged 6.7 liters per 100. So that average is continuing to drop, which is a good thing. So Joe, um, how are you traveling? What's your range looking like at the moment? Hey buddy, uh, 700 kilometers of range left. Okay, so uh, it's just started raining, uh, which means I have to use my wipers, which uses energy. And I've got 35 kilometers of range left and we have 32 kilometers to travel and I have 7% battery. So aside from that, everything's great. Oh, well, I hope the rain doesn't continue to pick up because I wouldn't want you getting stranded at the side of the road. 
<laughs> yes, uh, me too. Anyway, uh, my fing fingers and toes are crossed. just made it. So it's down to 2%. Uh, okay, so now is the moment of truth. I need to see if this actually works. Since there's four charges available, this is, I don't know which one this is. Okay, here we go. So that one. You look quite nervous. Verifying payment details. Still saying starting session. Well, it's saying it's starting, but nothing's happening. Yeah. Oh, here we go. I mean, I've just parked over there. Yes. It's going. Mate, I have no more concerns left. No, okay, cool. Oh, my work here is done. Shall I go to the fuel pump? Oh no, I don't even know. I don't even need to go to the fuel pump. No, I'll just, <laughs> no. Um, so let's have a quick look at how that has gone so far. Currently charging at 187 kilowatts. So it is, it is pumping along nicely, but I want to see what our economy has been like. So average economy, 21.7 kilowatt hours per 100 Ks. Not a bad figure. And, and like I said at the start, I have not done anything here to give this car an easy time. So I've just had the temperature set at 21, 22 degrees. It's currently 28 degrees outside here. Had my cooled seats on, been listening to music, podcasts, all that sort of stuff. So uh, we've done 456 kilometers on that first charge, which isn't too bad. It's not the figure that, that it said we would have, but I've, I've never driven 456 Ks on a highway in an EV in one hit. So from that point of view, it's actually pretty good. We've been doing 110 Ks an hour. Uh, that's GPS speed as well. So uh, we have been sort of pushing the car hard up against it. I think optimum uh, speed for a vehicle like this is like 80 Ks an hour. So uh, I think that's when you're going to achieve over 500 Ks. But uh, I think if we were to run this to totally empty, you'd probably get 460, 470 out of it. So it'll be interesting because the trip from here to Sydney is about the same distance. So I wanna make sure that we actually make it. Uh, it does start going downhill though. So yeah, hopefully we'll get somewhere, but uh, it is moving along now nicely now at 175 kilowatts, which should see it charged. Uh, it says here by 310, so in about an hour. So we'll go inside, have a bite to eat and see how we go. Okay, so charging is complete. I was actually surprised by that. So 99%, it's 3 p.m. It's taken about an hour to put uh, over 100 kilowatt hours into the battery. So this is a 105.7 kilowatt hour battery, but we've put in 107 or 108 kilowatt hours. So a little surprising. I think typically what happens is auxiliary systems like the cooling for the, for the battery, the fan that runs, the internal sort of air conditioning and stuff is powered by the charger until you disconnect. So that could be where that sort of extra has come from. But um, time to put in our next stop, which is Sydney. We may have to stop once on the way. We'll see how we go, but um, this should be, should be good. Okay, Joe, time for a status update. Uh, it says we have 263 k's left and I have 300 k's of range. I'm loving these downhill stretches. What are you looking like? Oh, mate, well, I've, uh, I've got 525 k's of range. Um, although, yeah, as we approach an uphill, it does seem to disappear pretty quickly. Um, but I think I'm pretty confident that I'm gonna get there with some uh, petrol in the tank. And what's your average economy like at the moment? So I'm currently sitting at 6.8 litres per 100. Actually went down to 6.6 .6 just after our lunch stop, uh, or should I say our charging stop. Um, but yeah, with these undulations, it's creeping back up again. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, with these undulations, I'm actually getting a really good return on economy here. So obviously on the uphill stretches, it's, it's not great, but on the downhill, it's really sort of uh, plumbing that energy back into the battery, which is good. Um, I was curious as well, 
so you've owned seven series before. How do you reckon this compares in terms of comfort levels? And then I'll, I'll share what I sort of think about the one that I'm in. Yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, the rear part of the cabin has come on again. So I think compared to the old F. 02, which was like a 2012, 2013 model. Uh, the rear of the cabin really was nowhere near S-Class levels. Then in the outgoing model, which was I think the G11 and G12, um, rear cabin came up a long way and was as good as the S-Class. And I think in this very latest G70, um, it's fantastic back there. I was playing around in the back of it yesterday and it really is night and day um, and better than S-Class undoubtedly you know? yeah look I, I totally agree I'm blown away with how much luxury is inside this cabin like these sort of merino whatever the seats are that we're sitting on uh, is so nice and th this whole thing just looks so luxurious and like if you do compare it to anything else on the market like a Rolls Royce has old school style whereas this is like a modern luxury designer interior and I think it is um, yeah it is one of the nicest interiors I've seen in a car before especially one that is tailored for this kind of thing so I think they've done a, a bloody awesome job with it. I was about to say don't use too much energy with your radio but then remember that the radio is thankfully independent to your battery source so uh, <laughs> you should be all right. Mate, radio is free of charge that's why I'm uh, using and abusing. <laughs> You're only allowed to park here for five minutes, you know that. That is the dumbest sign <laughs> I've ever seen. What the hell? <laughs> Who came up with that? Five minutes? I've just read the sign properly. Electric vehicles accepted. accepted. So you could park here. So Joe, I'll need you to move your car within five but that's minutes. Even dumb, but that's even dumb. So I've got some great news. Look at this, the legends at McDonald's did my coffee right this time. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to our other road trip video in the GT3 RS where I had a Karen moment where they didn't get the order right uh, and then also didn't really bother fixing it. Um, but anyway, I now have a decent coffee and I'm a happy man. Um, I'm also happy with the temperature, it's 20 degrees, so really good EV driving temps. Uh, stopped for a quick charge there while I waited for the coffee, up to 388 k's of range. Didn't need it, probably would have made it perfectly fine. And then distance remaining of 131 k's, hour and 22 minutes. So um, yeah, I'm excited to see the results because I think it is going to be very close indeed. Almost nine hours behind the wheel. We're only half an hour away from our stop in Sydney. Thankfully, I have just over 380 kilometers of range left. And I've been averaging 6.6 .6 liters per 100 kilometers. So it's been very, very efficient. In fact, this last stretch, although it's been undulated, there's definitely been less wind, which when you're doing an efficiency run, makes a huge difference. Hi everyone, so it is two weeks later. You'll notice there is no Joe. Uh, we ended up going go-karting when we got to Sydney. Uh, he lost quite badly and uh, he rushed off overseas because he couldn't bear to be around. I'm <laughs> just kidding. His trip was over, so he disappeared and we've now come back to crunch the numbers and have a look at the results. So these numbers are surprising. I'm gonna run you through uh, all of this in just a sec. Just as a reminder, we started our road trip at Ampole in Hawthorne in uh, Victoria. The plan was to drive to Sydney, which is almost 900 kilometers away. Both of them left at exactly 100%. The whole idea was we didn't want to cut down on energy use. So we both drove the exact same. We really just wanted to stick to the, the speed limits, uh, GPS speed limits. We wanted to keep air conditioners running. We didn't want to make it any easier for these cars than we absolutely had to, knowing that they are both the same vehicles beneath the skin. One is electric, one is internal combustion. So 
As a reminder, we stopped at Tarkata. We were there in total for an hour and seven minutes. That's how long it took the vehicle to get from 2%. You remember I arrived at 2% with massive range anxiety and got it all the way up to 100%. Took an hour and seven minutes. That cost $69.85. Uh, at 65 cents per kilowatt hour, and that was 107.5 kilowatt hours worth of energy. Joe stayed there for the same time that I did. Realistically, we finished eating about sort of 20, 30 minutes in. We had to film a couple of things, but he could have in theory just left whenever he wanted to. Our next stop was Sutton Forest. Uh, this is a stop that we didn't need to make. We would have actually made it all the way to Sydney um, with the electric vehicle without too many dramas, but I did want a coffee. So we did stop there in total for 19 minutes. That was enough time to plug up go inside, grab a coffee, come back out and leave. That cost $28.58 and that was again at 65 cents per kilowatt hour. We added 44 kilowatt hours into that. Then we drove to Sydney and the cool thing here with the electric vehicle is it actually added almost 20 kilowatt hours of energy back into the battery because it was predominantly downhill from Sutton Forest. So it meant that energy that would otherwise have been lost as heat uh, through the braking system, which is what would have happened with uh, Joe's internal combustion car, was actually plumbed back into the battery. And then we arrived at our final destination in Alexandria where we added uh, 48.53 kilowatt hours at a cost of $33.49. That took 42 minutes. It is quite slow when it gets to that last 20% of charge, but that was to brim the vehicle Vehicle. So our total cost for the electric was $131.92. Drum roll please. So what about Joe's internal combustion car? So he ended up spending $117.88, adding 56.16 litres of uh, 98 Ron. Uh, we ended up doing a total of just under 875 kilometres. He ended up spending six minutes uh, filling his vehicle, whereas in total for me, I ended up spending uh, two hours and eight minutes stopped charging. Uh, obviously some of that time was grabbing a coffee, grabbing some lunch, but in theory, if Joe uh, didn't stop, he would have only spent that six minutes fueling his vehicle. Uh, it's obviously not recommended that you drive almost 900 kilometers and don't stop. In theory, you'd be making like 20 minute stops every couple of hours just to stretch your legs. So it does show you that uh, here in this scenario, the electric vehicle was more expensive. A few of the things to take into account, we obviously use the same vehicles here, both seven series, but these were at the larger end of the scale. Not only is the internal combustion car quite heavy, the electric version of this is quite heavy as well. So while Joe averaged uh, around six litres per 100 k's, if you used a more efficient diesel or a more efficient internal combustion vehicle, you could push that down a little bit more and reduce your fueling costs as well. With the electric vehicle too, we ended up averaging just over 20 kilowatt hours per 100 k's, which is on the higher side. It's not outrageous, but it is on the higher side because we didn't cut back at any point. If you use something like a Model 3 long range or something that is more efficient at doing the same thing, obviously a smaller vehicle, not as practical as a big seven series, but it does show you that you would end up using less electricity, which would cost less as well. Now I thought this was a really interesting test because it does show you with electricity prices going up, they are going to become more and more expensive to charge on a road trip. It may be cheap at home, you might run solar at home, but if you are doing a long distance drive, it is going to become more and more expensive to charge an electric vehicle. When we did this same trip with a diesel and an EV recently, we ended up doing uh, almost 1500 kilometers and it only cost slightly more in the electric vehicle because we did have a free charge along the way and it was cheaper to fill the vehicle as well as we went. So clearly the costs have gone up much like everything in this world at the moment. So let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. I mentioned at the start of the video that while this is an extreme example, it is a vehicle with 105 kilowatt hour battery, if you are driving a smaller vehicle with a 50 or 60 kilowatt hour battery, you're gonna to have to stop more often. The charging is likely to be slower, but in the future where these batteries have better energy density and better charging, it is likely to be as convenient as it is in an internal combustion car, but will it be more cost effective? That is the big question. Let us know what you reckon in the comments section below. Do we screw up any part of this testing? Is there something we should have done better or differently? I'm really keen for your feedback. And if you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon button. Until next time, see you later.